without further ado, we're going to be focusing on marketing planning and using all of the touch points in your arsenal to reach your clients. So with that being said, how many people in this room actually have a marketing plan? Oh, okay. Nobody has raised their hand in this room, and that's okay. So I'm happy that you're here, so I'm going to be able to help you out a lot. So. With that being said, I always love to start this presentation off with going over a few stats here. These come from NAR. And so at a closing table, 89% of buyers said that they would use their realtor again in their next transaction. And then 73% of sellers said that they would use their realtor again in a transaction. But the reality of it is, is that only 27% actually did. Can anybody in this room tell me why that is? What was that again? They did not keep in touch. They did not keep in touch. That is 100% true. So that is a very troubling stat in my opinion because it's something that you guys have the power to change. And all it is is staying top of mind with your sphere. Your transaction, it doesn't end at the closing table. It is an ongoing thing, right? So. That leads into this. So with 2023, we're heading into the second half of the year here in July. July starts next week. That's quarter three. This is still a good time of the year to start up creating a marketing plan for the rest of your year. And then also kind of thinking about what you're going to be doing in 2024, right? So your goal is going to be staying top of mind with your sphere so you are not part of that 27% statistic. You're going to establish trust, credibility, and then let them know that you are the expert because we are the experts in this industry and it's our job to educate people and be there for them as they walk through this process because it's a big process and it's a huge purchase it can be a little scary so the other thing i always like to mention is that um, don't just sell provide value to your audience you guys know your audience better than anybody because you have worked with them you have to think about that as you work on creating marketing pieces for them you know is it families that you cater to? Is it going to be single people that you cater to? Different things like that. So that's something you have to keep in mind. So before we can really create a marketing plan, I do recommend kind of figuring out, again, who is your audience? And then I like to organize and categorize my SOI database into, into these little uh, buckets so that I know how I'm going to market to them specifically. So think of this A through F as a grading scale, kind of like we're back in school, right? The G stands for growth. So you should always be doing something to grow your sphere every, every week, every month, every year. You need to keep continuing to grow your business. So your A's are going to be the people who know you, they love you, they trust you and they're referring you. You're getting repeat business from them. You're getting their friends, their family, their neighbors, everybody. They are your biggest advocates. Bs are people that they know you, love you, and trust you. And they've worked with you, but they may not always refer you. Your goal is, again, trying to get people to you know, cycle up to the As. Cs are people that they know you, love you, trust you, but you really aren't sure where they are in regards to real estate. So you have to do a little bit of digging to figure out where that is and what type of messaging you need to use to target them. Ds are people that they know your name, but anytime real estate comes up, they forget about you. And that does happen quite a bit. <laughs> Fs are people that you found their info somewhere, but you don't know who they are, so you do need to get to know them. And then Gs, again, the growth area, these are people you don't know, so you're going to be picking them up from open houses, networking events, farming, like neighborhood farming, different things like that, as well as leads. So in order to fall into any of these buckets down here is some extra criteria that they need to meet. It's really important to collect data too, like phone numbers, email addresses, their physical home addresses, and be connected with them on social media because those are all different channels that you're going to be using in order to reach your audience. Does that make sense? Perfect. So once you categorize all of your audience in your database, you can then create a strategy behind how you're going to market to them, right? So your A's and your B's, your best supporters, you're going to touch them a lot more 
than you would the other people because you're getting the most business from them. So I have some agents that I work with that they, they use a lot more touches than what's listed here. I would say this is like right here, the bare minimum of what you would want to do. So you would be sending out 12 mailers a year. So that's one every single month that you're sending them. It doesn't have to be postcard. It could be a letter and it could be a handwritten note, but just some sort of direct mail piece that gets into their physical mailbox is important. 24 emails, yes. In, in your mind, would our market updates that are automatically sent out, would that count for the emails? It could be. We'll be talking about that here when we talk about the touch points. So that's coming up. So that's a great question. So keep that in the back of your mind. So 24 emails. We have a whole bunch of automated emails that you can sign people up for that just automatically trigger to go out to set it and forget it sort of thing. And we'll dive into that here in a second. Um, but quarterly phone call, guys, stay in touch. Keep up with them. And a quarterly phone call minimum for your best supporters goes a long way. Make sure you're staying top of mind with them through social media. You're posting, you're interacting with them online, and then you're inviting them to client events. Um, C's through F's so the people that you know, um, but they're not your best supporters yet. They will be. Um, you're going to touch them a little bit less. So six mailers, so that's every other month. 24 emails, an annual phone call instead of a quarterly phone call connecting with them through social media and inviting them to events. So this kind of game plan here, repeat that every single year with the goal of staying top of mind with them so they can't forget about you if you continue to kind of do a plan like this. So your growth area, so say you pick somebody up from an open house. So there's a strategy behind how you can target them with some marketing pieces so they can be converted to an A through F uh, audience member or a client. So I recommend you can decrease this down to one if you wanted to, but if you hit them heavy and hard, they definitely won't forget about you. So two mailers, two phone calls, two handwritten notes, and instead of an entire year, this is the a course of six weeks that you're sending out all of this stuff. It's very rapid fire. So after that six weeks has happened, you would then decide you know, which category do they fall into. Is it an A, B, C, D, or F category? Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions so far? Perfect. OK, so with that being said, let's talk and go into more depth into the different touch points that you guys have at your fingertips. So we're going to transition then in talking about the different touch points. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about direct mail. So let me ask this question. How many emails do you guys get in one day? 150. Oh, yeah, 150 or more. It's annoying how many emails you get in one day. Whether it, the work email, your junk emails, everybody has multiple emails. Some people check them every day, some people don't. How many pieces of mail do you get in your physical mailbox a day? Five or six. Man, you are so lucky. I would be tickled if I got five or six. I might get one to three pieces of mail a day. So the point that I'm making here. Do you think that has to do with witness protection? Maybe. It might be. I don't know. <laughs> um, but the point that I'm making here is that when you are sending a direct mail piece to your audience, you're going to be more likely seen using this channel versus sending somebody an actual email. So you're competing with a lot less in a physical mailbox than an inbox. Um, with that being said, there's multiple different types of direct mail pieces you can use. So we've already talked about probably all of these um, already, but postcards is one, handwritten notes is another, letters is another. We're, I'll dig into the postcards here in a second. Handwritten notes though, guys, we have note cards here at the office that you just have to go to Emily and ask her for some, and they're free. So you can grab some of those while you're here today, send write out a few of them, and you just have to pay for posts. So that's something we're already providing for you. You could even write a letter, print it out on the printers here. You can send it into a professional printer too if you want. If you print it here, we have a folding machine that's already set up for eight and a half by 11 sheets that will automatically fold it for you. So that takes off some of the folding process and cuts down that time that then you guys can use for other tasks. So those are some options for you. And then I'm going to exit out of this. Although I guess before I do that, um, 
I'm going to show you guys this because this is really fun. So these are just a few stats that I pulled for direct mail. And I really loved this one because I fall within that four to 10 Americans because I get really excited about getting mail every day. So I just wanted to point that one out. I don't know if anybody else in this room gets as excited as me about mail. But I also really love this. So 70% of consumers prefer traditional mail for cold or unsolicited offers. So think about like neighborhood farming or just listed, just sold, different things like that. People prefer that out of any other type of touch point you can use for cold, unsolicited offers. Mail also makes them feel valued as a customer. Now, I know that definitely makes me feel valued as a customer. And then it gives them a better impression of the company that sent it as well. So I always like to point those stats out when we're talking about direct mail. But I also wanted to show you guys on the agent a locker, we have two different vendors that we're partnering with for mail options. Number one is going to be Postcard Central, and we decided to introduce you guys to Postcard Central as a vendor because they're, they're absolutely fantastic to work with. Same quality that you get from Express Stocks, but they are more economical than what Express Stocks is. You're looking about 10 cents less per postcard through using Postcard Central. I do have some samples of some of the postcards from Postcard Central that I will pass around for you guys to see so you can feel the quality of them. They're great postcards. So going on to the site, something else too to keep in mind, when you guys order from the site, I always get a lot of questions about production lead time for these. Production takes one to three business days for it to be printed, addressed, and ready to go before they send it out to the mailing house. When it hits mailing houses, what it takes is if you're doing first class, it's going to be two to five days after that one to three production time period. And then if you guys use standard mail or pre-sort standard, it's going to be seven to 14 business days. So say you sent out an email, or not an email, I'm sorry, a postcard about an event that was coming up. Um, you would probably want to do it first class and you would also want to take into account how long it would take to create that piece and then calculate when it's going to hit people's mailboxes. So that's just something to keep in mind. Even with Express Docs, there's a lead time for that or any print, professional printer, there's going to be a lead time. Um, with that being said, any day of the week it would be what it comes like. I mean, if you're doing EDDM, so Every Door Direct Mail, that one is kind of like it's at the mercy of the postmaster that's delivering it. Um, and if you're doing EDDM, um, you also have to look out when it's election time because it'll go out with election mailers too. And so that also puts a kind of a pin in, in like when it comes to take, getting things out in time for that. But you don't have to worry about that with first class or the standard mail. You guys are good to go. So looking at what we have, so I'm continuously working on developing new pieces to add to the site for you guys. I have another one in the works. I'll talk about that here in a second. But what I do want to show you guys, we do have just listed, just sold on here. One of the examples, I don't know if it's the just listed or just sold that's being passed around here at the office. Um, but this is great, especially for neighborhood farming. And if you get a listing, send this out. I have a lot of agents that have used them in the past, and they've gotten some business from them. I had another agent that had the strategy of any time that they had a listing, they would do a just listed, or sometimes they would switch it up and do a just sold, and they'd send it to their sphere so that it was a constant reminder, hey, I'm doing well in the business. Here are some things that I've been doing and he would do multi-million dollar ones and he would do like a hundred thousand dollar ones to show the diversity of the listings that he had yes does postcard central do they have mailing lists all we have to do is yes. say here's the neighborhood send it to this neighborhood so you can in fact purchase lists from postcard central it's a little bit different though because it's a radius list and then you let them know how many people within the radius that you want to select um, there's also different things that you have to select on there too. I'd have to pull it up and look at it. Um, but so you, the, is there the ability to say Grandview Meadows, we want every homeowner sent? You would have to do a radius list on the map that covers that. If you want something more targeted, my recommendation would be going to, uh, is it Remind? Not Realist. I think it used to be Realist. I think it's Remind now. If you go to Remind, you can actually draw on the map and get very precise. Um, pulling that data 
so I would recommend going that route. Then you can also see the list too and edit it. If you pull from, from Remind, it will also pull rentals. So it'll say like trust. So you kind of want to go through and figure out, do I want to send to those people? If you could so take them. So pull that out of Remind, download it into a C CSV file, and then send it to Postcard Center, yes. and they'll go from there. Yes, you upload it. There, whenever you do the upload your own list, there's a template that needs to be followed, and it's all of the information is there. It's very easy. It's very straightforward. Compatible with Remind. Yes. Okay. Because you're uploading a CSV. Um, so we have just listed, just sold. We have general farming postcards, which is awesome. So some of them, like, do you know the value of your home? That's a great one to send out for just general farming. Thinking about making a move is another great one. This, I love this neighborhood uh, stat postcard because you can send it specifically to your neighborhood. I would recommend doing it about once uh, a quarter and you can let them know what's happening. So there is a stock photo that is included in this, but you can also take a picture of the front of the neighborhood and put it on this postcard and that is another strategy to get people to look at that postcard. Um, House Wanted is another option that you guys have on here. This is great for if you're trying to get into a neighborhood, but there's nothing for sale. I had an agent that I worked with at the previous brokerage. He used these religiously, and it worked really well for him, but he also paired it with other touch points, too. So he got a list of the people that lived in that neighborhood with their phone numbers, and he would do cold calling in that neighborhood in addition to sending these out. And then he would also would send out letters and he would do a little research ahead of time to figure out which home specifically met the needs that his clients were looking for. Um, so that's House Wanted. Ready to sell your home's a great one. This, I'm moving this time. That's if you came to this brokerage from another brokerage so you wouldn't have to worry about that for general farming. Ready to own your home. So that's renting or that is converting renters to buyers. So that's a good one to use too if you are targeting a lot of people renting. Um, offer accepted is another one. And then this is one of the newer ones that have been added. This is an introductory postcard to your specific neighborhood. If you live in the neighborhood, you would send this out and then you would start building out a 12 month farming campaign from there. Um, there's another postcard, it's another stat one that's going to be added to this site here soon where it has a whole bunch of listings and it gives a lot of data about the listings that have been in the area. So that's gonna be added here soon. The other place that you guys can go to, going back to Agent Locker, is Express Docs. Again, Express Docs is about 10 cents more expensive per postcard than what Postcard Central is. But this is a resource available to you guys and I always like to point it out. A Couple of things on this site. So there's the personal marketing. Here's a crap ton of done for you postcards that have already been designed and are ready to go. You just have to kind of go through and see which ones you want to use. And then I also like to point out the QR code generator on this site too because it's free um, and it doesn't expire. There's a lot of websites out there when you generate QR codes, they will expire after a certain period of time because they want you to do a subscription. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> that was not fun. So I don't recommend that, but this one, you guys are safe. The only time that your QR code doesn't work is if something with your link changes or your website goes down or something like that. Other than that, you're good to go. But I always like to point that out on here because it's a free resource for you guys. Um, the other thing too, if you are looking for something specific postcard wise, I am also a resource here for you guys and I can create a custom postcard for you. Um, I do offer custom design services at $35 an hour. If that's something that you want to explore, please set up a time to meet with me and we can chat about what your goal is and what, yes, Kyle. So you would target this particular web, uh, website for postcards and for QR code. That's where you would use this site. If you if you have a postcard that you're just wanting to get out really fast, um, it, you know you could use that if you wanted to. If you didn't want to do something custom, that's available. I have a lot of agents here that do go rogue, and they'll make their own, which is totally fine. But there are some rules and regulations you guys have to be aware of if you are creating something on your own. Do so, they ever go feral? <laughs> not not that I've noticed. They aren't feral. 
but you guys do need to make sure that the brokerage's logo is on all of your marketing pieces. That is a rule from my board, and you guys have to have that on there. You also need to have the uh, equal housing as well as the realtor logo, and there's some disclaimers that gets added to the back of a postcard when it gets sent out. I have received postcards that don't have those items, and if they get into the wrong hands, you can get in trouble for it. So that's just something to keep aware of. Um, so that's kind of direct mail in a nutshell. Emails is another touch point that you guys can do. So our IMS, how many of you guys are using the emails in the IMS? Fabulous. We have some people that are using it. I love it. So these are ones that you sign up your clients. They automatically go out for you, which is super nice. It's set it and forget it. I love set it and forget it stuff, right? So you have the monthly market updates, and then you have the neighborhood sold updates. Those only get triggered whenever something sells in a neighborhood. But my personal favorite is the home value report. So this is something that every time I've received like a home value report, I used to get a home bought from my lender. And every single time, even though I wasn't selling my house, every single time I opened it because I wanted to know what was happening with the value of my home. And I would bet you that there's clients that you guys have that would be very interested in seeing what the value is doing with their home currently, especially in today's market. It's crazy, right? Um, so that's emails. It's pretty straightforward. So phone calls is another one that I like to talk to people about. Um, I know we have some people that are really excited to do phone calls and some people that aren't so much excited to do phone calls, and that's okay. Um, but with that being said, uh, looking back at here, going back to our strategies, if you are targeting your A's and B's doing a quarterly phone call and your C's through F as an annual phone call, there's going to be a certain amount of phone calls that you need to make every single year. You can break that down and figure out from there how many each month you need to make, break it down further, and how many each week you need to make. Does that make sense? Um, so figure out how many you have to make, time block, so set aside time to get it done, and then you'll be able to reach those goals. Um, I have a lot of agents, bless you, I have a lot of agents coming to me asking, well, what are some reasons to call? So I've listed a few of them here. Some of them, checking in to say hello, driving by your house, thought of you. I'm not going to read all of these, but you can see what they are, but my, one of the ones that definitely got me was I had a friend that went into real estate and he called me one day and he was like, hey, I saw your neighborhood values have increased. It's really a great time to sell. Have you, have you thought about selling and, and getting a bigger house? This is a great time to do it. And funny enough, it was, fell within that three to five year range. I was like, oh my gosh, well, what's my house worth? And yeah, I'm interested in selling. So somebody called me and used this tactic and it, it worked on me. So I know it's gonna work on other people because it, it does work. If you have questions about scripts or you need help with role playing with the phone calls, Kyle and Jeff are great resources for you guys. Same thing with emails. Kyle has some emails that he's pre-written, especially about new construction. When he sends those out, he gets, inf not information, it is information, but he gets emails back from his clients. Does anybody have any questions about phone calls? Perfect, okay. So social media. So social media, let's be honest, this could probably be its own talk in itself. It's pretty robust. Um, but we're only gonna talk about it a little bit today. Um, the other thing too to keep in mind, I have a lot of agents that are solely focused on social media and they're not using all of these other touch points all together with their social media. So there's an opportunity miss. So I'll, I'll just say that and then we'll, we'll talk about social. So how many of you guys have a business page? Okay. How many of you guys have a personal page? How many of you guys just have a personal page? That's totally fine. Um, so as far as like content, when you're thinking about developing content, I like to follow the 80-20 rule. You guys don't have to follow this rule, but it's just kind of a good rule of thumb when you're trying to strategize and coming up with content. So if you're using your business page, 80% of the content should be business related, 20% should be personal. 
Can anybody tell me why you would want to put personal stuff on your business page? Yes, makes you likable. Yes, helps, helps people to get to know you. You're relatable. Uh, that's exactly the reason. So for a personal page, it's flipped. 80% is personal, 20% is business. Can you tell me why on a personal page you would still want to post business? Yes. That is right on. That is correct. For anybody that didn't hear it, so that people know what it is that you do. So I worked with an agent that he had a business page and he had a personal page. And he never posted on his, his personal page that he was a realtor. He's like, nobody's following my business page. I don't know what's up with that. And uh, so I challenged him. I was like, well, have you been posting on your personal page? He's like, well, no. People can go to my about section and see I'm a realtor. Let's be honest, you guys. People don't pay attention to that stuff. They just don't. So I challenged him. I was like, go ahead and post this week and see what happens. I got a phone call midweek from this agent. And he was like, Bree, I've had people reach out to me. They had no idea that I was in real estate. And it's led to all these conversations about real estate. So there's value in posting about it on your personal page. Um, and definitely value, obviously, posting on your business page. Um, frequency. So studies have shown that three times a week is optimal for your algorithm. If you post more than that, totally fine. You can post as much as you want, but three times is optimal for the algorithm. If, I know that sounds like a lot because that's 12 posts a month. So if you're not used to doing that, my recommendation would be to reel it back here at the start, get into a good rhythm and habit, start off with once a week. And then once you get into that, that rhythm and habit of it, then up it to two and then up it to three. That's my recommendation so that you can get yourself there. So what should you post on social media? Good question, right? I have a lot of people coming in like, I don't know what to post. So here is a list of some ideas for you on what you could do. So education. So we are here to educate our clients, be there with them as they walk through this process. Some of the process, the buying and selling process, it's very robust. You could even take that, split it up into a series of posts, and I recommend doing that as a video um, if you're comfortable doing video. Video is king on social media. It will perform better than a static post, and a static post is an image with just a caption. So I'm going to be using that static post terminology a lot, and that's what that means. Um, renting versus buying, you know, what do you have to do to get a house ready to go on the market? Different things like that that could be from an education standpoint. Does anybody else have any ideas from the education bucket that you could include in this? Anybody? Yes? How to deal with the bunion on your book. That might be more of a, a, a personal thing, but hey. Maybe, maybe you're, you know your audience best, so maybe, maybe your audience deals with a lot of bunions and you're trying to offer something that's of value to them. <laughs> market updates is another one. Guys, I provide market stats to you every single month. That is a social post that you're not having to create because it's already been provided for you. My recommendation would be to take it a step further. Instead of using the image, I would recommend that you create a video. And in the video, you explain what each of the items that are listed on the stats, what they mean. The average consumer doesn't always know what they mean. So it's worth taking that time, again, going back and educating them of what it means. Um, you know, what's happening in the market? What are the conditions? What can people expect going into the market? You know, mortgage rates, uh, you have to be careful with that. If you do anything with mortgage rates, you have to disclose an APR with an interest rate. My recommendation if you go this route would be to partner with like Amy or Alexi or your mortgage rep and create a video with them. And if you do that, it's such time sensitive information, you need to post it right then and there too. Um, just something to keep in mind. Anybody else have any ideas for market updates? No? That's okay. So area expert, I like to put this on here because not only are we real estate experts, but we are also area experts and we need to make sure people know and understand that. So you can do that by highlighting a neighborhood or a city specifically, talk about it, um, get people excited about it. You could talk about local businesses that you love to support or my personal favorite, for anybody in here that knows me well knows I love to eat, I would highlight restaurants. <laughs> 
I went to this restaurant the other day. It was fabulous. You have to go check it out. I had X, Y, Z, you know, different things like that. Um, you know, are there any community events that are coming up, you know, that your audience that you're catering to that would really relate to that and want to go to that? Are there parks in the area? If you work with a lot of families with young kids, there's a lot of like splash parks or spray pads that are free to the public to use, but a lot of people just don't know about it. So you could be providing that information, providing that value to them of, you know, hey, get out of the house. There's a lot of, you know, stay at home moms that do want to get out of the house. So this may be an option for them. Um, you do breweries, wineries, different things like that. Again, Think about who is your audience, what keeps them up at night, you know, what motivates them, different things like that, and think about what type of um, information that you can provide to them of value. Uh, I always like to point this one out, a uh, question. So start creating a list of questions that you get asked on a regular basis from your clients because that's really content for you to be sharing on social, um, and it, it makes it easy. In the moment, I would say, you know, what are you doing? Are you showing a house? Different things like that. This would really lend to stories on social media versus posts. You could still do it as posts, but this could be stories if you're looking for ideas for that. Keep in mind, stories only last 24 hours, so they really don't count as that three times a week because they go bye-bye. <laughs> There's no history of it, right? But stories are fun. Helps people get to know you, and it's used for in the moment, kind of organic sort of um, moments. The other one, the last one would be vendors, uh, you know, mortgage lenders, say you have like an HVAC person that you love, trust, maybe there's an inspector, or handyman, you know, who do you partner with that you love and you want to like basically say, hey, this is a trusted partner, use them, I love them, so on and so forth. Anybody have any questions? That leads to planning out and scheduling. So this is the tool that I'll be sending out later today for you guys. And it was a tool that I worked with Jenny Carrington and we developed it together so that you guys could sit down and basically kind of brainstorm and come up with an idea of what you're gonna do each month. So this is page one, page two, and then this is the rest of the packet that you'd be getting. So here we have four categories and you can take all of the categories we had talked about on the previous slide and put them in here. So Kyle, your bunion issue that you brought up can go into your yeah. personal section if you wanted to. Okay. But you would, this is supposed to be used basically as a brain dump. So brainstorm, put as many ideas as you want down. Whatever you don't use this month, you can then use for the next month, right? The next page would be plotting it out to figure out what days are you gonna post and uh, you, so you would come in here, say what month it is, put which day it is, and then you would figure out, okay, I'm gonna post on here, here, and here. Maybe I wanna post this day, this day, and this day. Whatever you wanna do, you can basically plot it out on here so it gives you a visual, a game plan of how you're going to schedule out your social posts. And then the last pages of the planner. So say you started on a Monday, right? So you'd write the date here, You'd write down the topic that you put on this sheet. You'd say what type of social is it? Is it going to be a video? Is it going to be a static post? What is it going to be? And then I'm going to force you guys to write a caption. Aren't you guys so excited? <laughs> That's what this space is used for. So you guys can write out your captions right there. And then if you have a business page, the beauty of having a business page is that you can schedule out your social media posts for the entire month, set it and forget it by using the Meta Business Suite on Facebook. And it also links not only to Facebook, but Instagram. So you're able to schedule it out across platforms. And again, it's another set it and forget it sort of thing. You just have to remember to do it once a month. Um, the other benefit of a business page is that you're able to track your performance. And then you'll notice trends as to what content is really resonating with your audience. You'll also see which times they're active, so that'll clue you in onto which days. And actual like, oh, say, my people are very active at like 1 p.m. or it might be like 9 p.m. or something like that. It'll tell you that information if you have a business page. If you don't have a business page, you just would have to have the discipline to get in every day and like post essentially, but you would have your game plan put together, which is really nice. Any questions? No? Okay. 
So that's social media in a nutshell. I know we can spend a lot more time talking about it, but we have two more touch points to talk about today. So the next one is Popeyes. Is anybody in this room, does anybody know what a Popeye is? You do, you do? Um, so for everybody in the room that doesn't know what a Popeye is, it's essentially a small gift that you get and you put like a tag with it and then you pop by somebody's house, you drop it off for them and it's a good in-person touch point that brings those warm fuzzy feelings. So uh, good Popeye etiquette, so two things, one, ideally if somebody's home, you get to see them, you have that interaction with them, but if they're not, you just leave it on their porch, take a picture of it, and then call, or not to call, but text it to them. You could even create a video of it too and send them a video that you left it there and just say something along the lines of, hey, I was thinking about you today, I was in the area, left a little something on your porch for you, make sure you check it when you get home, that sort of thing. I also recommend keeping some Popeyes in your trunk. I wouldn't recommend chocolate for this because it will melt, um, but just some sort of Popeye in your trunk. So when you have a listing appointment, you can have this pop by with you, you can give to your clients, and it's just another nice touch that you can do for them as well. Um, client events is the last one. I do recommend doing at least two client events a year if your budget allows for it, one minimum. Um, this helps, uh, it's just a way to give back to your community essentially, it makes them feel good. Um, I've had people do some really extravagant events over the years, but I've also had people do more simplified events. So a simplified event would be maybe you hire a photographer to come and you either have it at a park, you could have it at a model home, you could check with the guys to see if they would be okay with you having it here, and they could do family photos for your clients. I've had people do food drives, I've had people do events at pumpkin patches, um, um, one of the most extravagant events <laughs> that I have been involved with was a uh, an agent decided to rent out Grand Junction Brewery and they had a huge bingo night and so they had massive prizes that they were giving away but their audience that they were catering to uh, were multi-million dollar yeah, clients. So it made sense with what he did, going all out extravagant, had massive gifts that he gave away. It was a really cool event uh, altogether, but not everybody does stuff like that. Uh, so that's client events for you. And then the last thing I have, this is gonna look a little crazy, a little overwhelming, that's okay. But this is a snapshot of your whole year. You have quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. Guys, we're getting ready to head into July. So quarter three, this is the last half of the year that you can focus on building out a marketing plan. At the bottom of this page, you'll see what the icons mean. You have direct mail, emails, phone calls, social media, pop buys, client events, and G stands for growth because every single month you should be doing something that allows for you to grow your business. So as we're looking at this, let's, let's create an example. So I like to say, you know, if you were gonna do a client event, say October, it's coming up, what if we did something at a pumpkin patch, right? So right here, we have our event here, we'd say, you know, client event, pumpkin patch. So then you kind of think about what other touch points you have. So maybe in July, you reach out to the pumpkin patch and you're like, hey, we need to figure out which pumpkin patch we're gonna have it at. We're gonna to need to find out pricing, all of that stuff, and kind of solidify it, all of the details. From here, you might. this may be the month that you solidify and commit to the pumpkin patch, I don't know, depending on their lead time that they need. But then you can look at it from, okay, well, I'm going to need to save the date, right? So with my save the date, am I going to email that out? Am I going to physically mail that out? And which, which month should I send it out in? Oftentimes people will send it out two months in advance. You could send it out earlier if you wanted to. So say you did, it was an email, or maybe you text out a save the date. So there's two touch points here where it's save the dates that are already knocked out on this plan, right? And then here, September, you probably would want to send out a physical invitation to your clients. So that covers one of your touch points here, right? 
maybe as you get into, uh, depending on if it's at the start of the month or the end of the month, if you aren't getting a whole lot of RSVPs, maybe your phone calls that month are focused on following up with your clients and saying, hey, I noticed you haven't RSVP'd. Are you guys going to be able to make it to the event? That sort of thing. And so you just kind of go through and you have to think about, it's, for me, it's easier to look at it from the perspective of an event and then filling in touch points from there. And then I would also recommend printing this out and having one for your A's and B's and then your C's through F's and different things like that. Growth, you could say, hey, I'm doing X amount of open houses this month or I'm going to go to this networking event or I'm going to farm this neighborhood, different things like that. Does that make sense on how this would work? So I'll be sending this out um, after the, the chat here, but that's really all that I had for today. So does anybody have any questions?